that's not accounted for in the cost, then uh, uh, consumers are not willing to, to pay larger, uh, higher prices than uh, they might have. Thanks, I think this is a very good point. Um, I, I'd like to bring up a, a campaign that was run two or three years ago by uh, one of the pioneers in the field that you already might know, I'm sure, Armed Angels, uh, a Cologne company. Um, they had a, a billboard that said, like, um, Think like a, a jacket was displayed and it was like a hundred euros and then the price was crossed out and the new price was uh, 180 euros and uh, that's not what we usually see it's actually the, the right price I'd say because there was a little star saying made by humans and that's exactly the point that we need to get aware of again that you and I as, as, a, as a consumer we are very much educated that stuff is cheap. It's the same. It's the same thing when you go to the supermarket and buy a steak that's like three euros, uh, and it's a half pounder or something. Like that's not what it actually can costs due to the amount of, of work and to due to the uh, yeah due to all the stuff that's flown in into production of a piece of meat. That's just not the real price. Uh, we will get to the real price discussion earlier or later. I think this is a very important point. We would say the legislators should take a more active role in that. Um, well, what you see at the moment is when you when you look at job advertisements, um, you see a lot of demand for sustainability managers, and this is not because people or many companies, uh, um, for example, the banking sector, um, they realize they have to do something. This is because uh, there's new legislation. 2017 that is asking for non-financial report, and so uh, the expertise that is necessary to get this reporting done is uh, to be looked for in the market, and so legislation has an impact here, and I think it has an impact in many other fields, but it's, as was discussed before, it's just one piece of the puzzle, but I think it can be very helpful. question to you. Uh, how are we as Germans doing in terms of sustainability? Do we care? I mean, in comparison to other countries? Uh, it's, a, it, it's a good question. I mean, the, uh, the issue of food was raised and I think they are we doing rather badly, right? Because they're not really willing to pay um, uh, decent amounts of money for, for good food. Um, uh, then on the other hand, uh, if you think about, uh, uh, say, collection of waste or so, it looks as though uh, 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 Germany is a little more advanced than other countries, potentially. So uh, my impression is that uh, there is uh, kind of a divide. There's some, unfortunately relatively few people, um, uh, who uh, are serious about sustainability, who uh, incorporate that into their lifestyle, and then take the right decisions. And then there's many others who uh, haven't done so yet. Right. So uh, I would think that, uh, uh, but that problem you also have in the United States or in uh, other countries like uh, China and so forth. So I think. Uh, it's probably not really a German-specific problem, or we don't have a German-specific solution to it. But uh, I, I don't think there's nothing to be proud of, really, in terms of our sustainability. Okay. So maybe to the startups, what is your feeling about this? Because you are in direct contact with consumers. Do consumers care about sustainability? And do you see differences if you look at millennials, if you look at Generation X, if you look at baby boomers? Do they show differences in their behavior and their interests? I think it's becoming more and more. So also uh, what Wunderberg was telling about that 40% of their uh, retail stores are actually sustainable and then 60% are just the normal regular stores. And we see that as well with Ruma, that especially at the Green Showroom, which is a uh, fair here in, uh, in Berlin, which is for uh, fair and social and sustainable brands. Uh, we started to present Ruma there like two years ago and it was very small and uh, now it's became bigger and bigger and there's actually a waiting list for our brands. And then uh, first you were speaking to retailers that were really focused on organic and fair fashion and now you see a lot of retailers coming by and they say yeah I only sell commercial fashion 
I'm actually not really interested in sustainable fashion. That's really what they say. But I see that my consumers are start, ask, start asking questions. So they start looking into the garments. Where is it produced? What materials have been used? So you see that the consumer behavior is changing and that they are asking more and more for sustainable fashion. And you see it, of course, first with the food industry. You see it with cars. You see it with everything, with, uh, with electricity that um, things that are good for the environment and for people are becoming more and more uh, important. And that's also part of the, of the fashion industry, yeah. 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 I could do see differences, what I said, you know, in the different age groups. Do one group cares more or the other less? Is one group more educated than the other? Yeah, you ask also if it becomes mainstream, is it just mm. a small trend? For us, it's clear that it's a trend or it's a mega trend, more or less. Uh, we feel it, if uh, looking back in my school, we had sometimes uh, project weeks of volleyball, uh, Hauswirtschaft, you know, uh, cooking, whatever. Now they have sustainability or they have uh, yeah, food and this is totally different. And we see it also for, for people who want to make a uh, trainee with us, uh, practitioners, this is really, um, yeah, this is, I think, especially young uh, women, uh, okay. they are very open for that. And uh, this, the next generation, I think they care a lot for that. Mm. And they come also, they, they say they spend more money for it and uh, not like the other trend, like Primark. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, the, the very cheap stuff is also important uh, because Today, the, the young kids with 13, 14 years, they buy for the monthly uh, uh, pocket money, they buy their own fashion stuff. And yeah. in my generation, I think it was still with mommy at this time. And now um, it's really, they go, <laughs> yeah, sorry, but it's like that. Uh, now the, the, the girls, they want to make everything together and so they have 30, 30 euro and they go to, to Primark, to whoever mm. and buy an, an fit, an outfit. Yeah? And, or the, the, the denim for 6, 7 euro, our button is already for 70 cents because it's made in Wuppertal. Mm. Yeah? So it's totally different out of metal and not mm. uh, from, from Far East uh, out of uh, very, very light uh, metal or, or plastic. So now I want to move a little bit more in the direction of supply chain management and maybe question to you both. What are the biggest challenges in building a sustainable supply chains? For both, for starters, but also for corporates. Um, what do you see happening? Well, I, I think one of the challenges is, is indeed that uh, fashion supply chains are often inherently global. And uh, associated with it is uh, all the issues that we saw, s some of which in the film, is to ascertain that your supplies actually uh, work according to certificates that uh, there might be and uh, maintain the standards. Plus then there's uh, a lot of transportation going on between the stages, which is often uh, rather uh, polluting in terms of CO2 emissions. Uh, so I think one solution, and that's uh, kind of tying up to what we saw with this micro factory idea, is that uh, you make the whole supply chain much more local in that uh, uh, you have uh, small factories that might be based on uh, 2D printing or even 3D printing, uh, like uh, Adidas has just uh, started in Ansbach, um, uh, where we actually have uh, the, the raw materials sourced locally and then uh, the product being printed uh, uh, or produced locally such that uh, the, the whole CO2 footprint at least uh, becomes much smaller as compared to uh, today's uh, globalized supply chains. Okay, so do you see that the supply chains are returning back to the Western Europe? Well, I wouldn't say not yet uh, really a return or a renaissance of, uh, say, German uh, textile manufacturing or shoe manufacturing. But it's an example, and uh, often technologies evolve more quickly than we might think. And uh, so right now the scale, of course, is rather small. If you stick to the example of Adidas, they can produce their 500,000 shoes a year, where the total production is like 300 million pairs of shoes. Mm for themselves only, right? So you see it's a relatively small scale yet, 
but uh, there is potential to increase that uh, significantly. Um, I think one, one other important point is that it makes it difficult for established brands to really get through the, the supply chain is the enormous complexity um, the, the fashion sector has to deal with. I mean, you, you guys, um, he could not really fulfill the quality, um, uh, yeah, the quality that, that we expect from them. So he had to turn to another supplier and he doesn't even know where his, this guy comes with stuff from. So I think the complexity um, is, is really, really uh, striking and uh, can have a, an enormous impact uh, once that is figured out. Yeah, then that corporate and also start up a little bit. I'm talking about my own experience then, but what for us is very important is, uh, was very important is to find the right partners that are willing to supply you with especially the fabrics and also the final items. Because when you are small and you go to a manufacturer or a fabric supplier, they just want to do the big uh, runs, the fabric runs, a lot of meters, a lot of items that you have to produce. And that's mainly not possible because you don't have the resources, you don't have the clients for it, which makes it very difficult to come into the right direction that people want to help you. And I think it's very difficult for startup brands to find the right partners that are willing to help you and that are also sustainable. Uh, that was one of the biggest challenges, I think, for Ruma in the past two years, yeah. yeah. So you would say the scaling aspect is the, the hardest part of it? Yeah, not the, the starting part is the hardest, and then scaling is not that difficult, because then you have a certain amount of customers, and you can come to a certain point that you're creating a certain amount of items, and then there are a lot of manufacturers that are willing to work with you, but at the beginning it's very, very difficult to find these right partners that are doing it for the right cause as well and that are offering the sustainable and fair uh, materials to you. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to move a little bit more in the direction of entrepreneurship and I would like to ask you, what do you think, what are the pros and cons of starting as a social business, as a sustainable business? Are the benefits, are the disadvantages? Because um, Anya and, and I, we met you at the Green Showroom, which is a trade show for sustainable fashion. While you guys, you said that you are selling already with mainstream fashion brands and you go to the fairs for mainstream fashion brands. So what are the pros and cons of, you know, marking yourself as a sustainable brand? <laughs> No, uh, it was funny to hear that, and I also wrote it, I read it on, uh, on the website of uh, Wunderwerk. So what we did at the beginning, we also went to the big commercial trade fairs. Uh, but then we were just starting, and we had a very small collection, and uh, we were just falling away uh, through all the big brands that were presenting their collection. So it was all, uh, almost a shame to, to sit there, and nobody w was willing to talk to you. And then we, uh, when we had increased our collection a little bit, then we went to the green showroom. And uh, you have seen it. Uh, that are, is actually a kind of startup hub for small uh, brands. And then we, we, we became one of the biggest, which was for us really nice because then we really could stand out and people were interested because it was, now we have a collection of 70, 80 uh, styles, which was at the beginning when we presented at the big fairs only 15 or 20. Um, so now we are win one of the bigger ones, and then you really can attract the people. Uh, but we, we, so we say that we are a sustainable brand. We are as well, and we communicate like that. But uh, we don't push it too hard because I think that it should become mainstream. And we also focus on the commercial retailers. So also, I think that the retailers, the wholesale that we sell to, is quite similar. It's also around 60, 40, 70, 30, maybe even. So it's quite funny to see, and also that the people are still asking more and more for the sustainable brands and Ruma is a high fashion brand so you also stand out a little bit towards other uh, sustainable brands in the Netherlands that are uh, quite basic and then uh, you form part of the of the big fashion houses which is then really nice for us but it's another yeah. topic yeah 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 first it's uh it was quite hard, let's say, with Tim, I have a partner where we have uh, a lot of money, I have to say. We have to talk about money also if you start, because you start with, let's say, 70 or 100 styles or product groups. You have uh, agents where they're going to sell. 
So you have to make a, it's, uh, it's called uh, sampling. So you make maybe nine or 10 collections just to, to invest, invest, to give to your agents and then gonna sell. So for Benelux, we have one, we have uh, four, five in Germany, we have uh, Austria, yeah, so they, they have the same collection. So you have to invest first before the, the fairs, where very cheap also. Uh, you have to, uh, yeah, a small booth, depends uh, where it is uh, in Berlin, for example, the most expensive, the premium, we, are, we were now the last years. Um, a booth of 25 square meters cost between 4,000 and 20,000, 25 maybe, 1,000 euro for three days. And this all, you know, it's before you have the first invoice yeah. to your customers. Yeah, and then you have to convince the customers. You are there and who are you? Nobody knows you. They say, okay, it has to be nice. Also, the people has to be there. And so uh, there's not the market coming to you. Oh, you are sustainable. Okay, now I buy because even they want to earn money. It's a risk. And the big uh, department stores, for example, uh, also to, to, to take a new brand, what is maybe not performing is also a risk. So it's not that easy to come in just because we are sustainable. Yeah, and so uh, it has to be fashion, it has to be um, extraordinary or special. And so this is also a key. And then if you talk about production, this is also what we was a big challenge for us. It's always, if you have a good, uh, a very big growth, then um, yeah, you have to finance the production. It's not the customer they don't pay you before, so you have to provide it. And if you know, if you have good contacts to banks, or if you are working for a bank, for example, the fashion industry is uh, quite similar to the gastronomy. So, like, yeah, it's very, very bad to get credits. It's not that easy, and so uh, this is a big challenge also. Yeah. Okay. So a question to Stefan and Patrick, um, what do you think, who will be driving the change in sustainable fashion? Will it be more the startups or will it be the large corporates? Um, Where do you see more hope? And, um... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a very positive person. I, I think um, there, there, there's hope and we, uh, in, in general, um, and the hope lies especially in the next generation of, of customers who, who look into these things, who, who utter the demand that they would like to purchase something with a, with a good conscience, basically, and they're interested to, to have this kind of clothing uh, on their body um, that has, you know, some, they carry some meaning with it. They want to be part of good, so to say. Um, and I think the, the intermingling of corporates realizing that they're young companies who are very successful in the way of doing their business sustainably, that makes them click, that makes them think, okay, maybe there's something about it, you know, it's not just being nice and ethical and stuff, it's about being successful in the market. And um, I think when you look at CNA and uh, all the big brands, um, they are investing in this, in this kind of thing. They they are not half as far as, as you guys are, I think, uh, in, in, in what they are doing. Um, but they realize they have to change. And um, the good thing about big ones learning from small companies is, um, on, a, on a global scale, you guys have like the knowledge of how it really can work. Like, and, and you are like, the, like shiny examples, like Lighthouse, Lighthouse examples. But the big companies, if they turn just a little bit, these, tu these huge tankers, they, they can change quite a bit because they have a huge supply chain and a huge customer base. And if this changes, um, then that's really like a pivotal point. And this can really change the entire industry. But I think like the, um, the back and forth between small, successful, young companies and big established ones, this is going to generate some heat and some friction and this is going to be good. Stefan, what do you think? Uh, I also think that it's very much going to be very much driven by startups. Uh, let me give you an example from another industry, like the car industry. Tesla was the one who really pushed the kind of established uh, car makers towards uh, thinking and developing uh, electric vehicles. And uh, similarly, I think here uh, there's many uh, great initiatives in terms of sustainable fashion. 
And uh, as you rightly say, uh, the bigger ones are thinking about it too, like uh, if H&M now offers a repair, that is also an interesting step towards uh, becoming, trying to become a little bit more sustainable. So uh, yeah, I think uh, you guys are doing the right thing to uh, turn the industry around. Wonderful. So we're going to try to wrap up with my questions. I have one final question to all of you. How do you think the fashion industry will look from five years from now? And where do you think are the most opportunities in the industry for new entrepreneurs, for somebody who wants to start? So it's a question for all of you. I think the most of the biggest opportunities are in the things that we have seen on the River Blue uh, documentary about how you can dye the fabrics and how you can produce the final products. And what was the first part of the question? How will the fashion look, uh, oh, yeah, fashion in industry years, in five years yeah. or ten years? Yeah. Um, um, I think that, and um, what you were telling about the big tankers, that they, if they change, then many things will change. And I think that uh, it's slightly happening. So I think within five years' time, uh, it will look differently. Uh, still, we will have a lot of problems with it. But um, then when we talk about ten years' time, I think many things will be changed because it's not possible anymore. And you see it now with this fashion movement. Uh, first, it were in 2015, 200 brands that were reacting on who made my clothes. The year after that, it was doubled already like four times. And now it are more than 2,000. And if it next year will be 4,000, and then the year after that it will be 8,000, then we're going absolutely into the right direction and bringing the consumers under the right attention of what is happening in the industry. And then things will change. And I think that that will happen uh, absolutely in the coming five to maybe ten years, yeah. Okay. yeah the direction is clear, so you see Chibo in, in Germany, TNA, you said uh, H&M, a lot of blend, okay, uh, blended uh, qualities also with uh, conventional cotton, but the direction is there. So in five years I think there will be much more. Now the brand only also has uh, launched a small sustainable thing so everybody's uh, on this track so the direction is clear but it won't i think in five years it's not uh, everything is uh, won't be sustainable as also organic cotton has to be grown yeah so the the fields has to be uh, there you know so okay. i uh, i think another lever that is currently unexpected exploited yet uh, is uh, digitalization. Uh, we heard about that uh, previously with respect to the microfactory. Also, uh, uh, the amount of data that is there to better understand the customer and hence to produce a product that really suits my taste and hence uh, creates a less of a willingness of mine uh, shipping the stuff back. Like, if you think that uh, if I buy today at Zalando, there's a 60% chance that I will uh, send the stuff back. That, from an environmental point of view, is just a disaster. And so I think that is going to be reduced over time. That is going to be more clothing. That is exactly to my taste. And hence, uh, 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 I will use it longer. I will not throw it out uh, after a couple of weeks. And hence, uh, make the whole thing sustainable. Yeah, I I think like uh, I do not have to add much to to, to these to these things that that you already said. Um, I think the direction is clear. Um, it is uh, maybe a bit of a similarity to the food sector that uh, we were mentioning earlier as a as a kind of a comparison. Um, if you look um, at mass market really in the, in the food sector um, and you compare how um, the the shelves and um, all the all the portfolio of products you could find in an, in an Aldi in Germany looked like five or ten years ago. You would hardly find any um, organic stuff, any fair trade stuff there. Uh, go into the same uh, into the same retailer again today, and you will find a whole range of different uh, brands that um, are organically sourced or are, are traded traded fairly. Um, 
of course, this is not the pure, the pure good that you, that you will find there because it is mass production now. And this is another challenge when it becomes mainstream. As you said, the cotton has to be grown and there's a whole lot of side effects that comes along with it. And this is what is known under the name rebounds. So you want to do something good and something bad might come of it if you're not careful. Um, my, my hope though, um, in addition to, to what you uh, said uh, the fashion sector might look like in five to ten years, is that people start, um, start mending their stuff again, you know, yeah. start, start wearing their, their high quality jeans that maybe cost 100 or 150 euros, but uh, you really like that and it's good quality and um, then you start repairing stuff again. And, um, H&M came, came out uh, a month ago or so with a take care campaign that is a, like a homepage of, of tips and tricks how you can mend your clothing and how you can make it last longer and so on. And I think this is really important again to um, have an idea that there's something worth that you have and it is worth um, um, to, 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 safeguard, to safeguard it and take care of it. And I think this is true for many, many things that we buy. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, yeah, so and now I would like to open it to all of you and encourage you to ask questions. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, ask a question towards the entrepreneurs in the room, uh, especially in the panel. Um, how much did you have to invest time-wise and money-wise to create a successful brand and uh, bring it to break even? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we started with our own money, let's say uh, 150, almost 100. 80,000 euro we had on the table to, to, for the next three years, let's say. Started like that. Talking to the banks also, but at the beginning we don't get any money. So it really saved money for that. We start like that. We, we said we do it right and we know what we need. We know what we do. We know where to go, where to sell, more or less. But in the end, uh, yeah, it's like that. And so we... We said in within three years we made a minus uh, in the first and second year in the sec in the third year it's a uh, it's a zero and it it was like that also so after three years but three years without any salary for us that I have to say so it's like uh, it's an investment yeah and coming from a company like like me where I you know I, I had a good salary. I got uh, a good bonus always if I perform. It's, a, it's really different, so not that easy, but uh, it's a good decision. Yeah? It's, it's very important to have a good partner also, but it's also that's important that the market is right for that. Yeah. And if you do the right and perfect product, somebody has to see you also. So it's not easy to come in the, to, the, to the newspaper to... Yeah, it's, it was great that we won the, at the beginning the, the, the award, yeah, the Bundespreis Eco Design. That was fantastic. But in the end, it's, yeah, nobody knows so, so much. So it's not that easy because if you are good, if you have a lot of money in, to invest for marketing, it can be very quick. But it's also not, it's also a challenge. Yeah. I completely share the story with you. Um, yeah, we are. You mentioned three years, right? When you go after it went well, it was three years you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. So it, we are now going into our third year, and now at the end of this year, beginning of next year, um, I think that we really have we have established a brand now. But you need approximately three to four years to really establish your brand, to find your way, to find the right people, to find your style, your direction, and everything and also to earn the money with it. And the most difficult thing of the industry is, and what you were already telling, it's that you spend a lot of money before you earn the money because you are, for example, our designers are now focusing on the autumn winter 1920 collection, 
which will be in store in uh, August 2019. So which is one and a half years time, but we are now starting to making costs already for this collection. And then we start selling it a year later, and then you sell it to the retailers, and then you go into production, which is approximately also four to five months, and then you deliver to your retailers, and then they start paying, if they pay. So, <laughs> so um, it takes a long time, and you need to invest a lot of money before you can send out your invoices and you uh, get the money into, play, in the, into the right place. Um, but I think three to four years, yeah, and you need money to, to start the brand. Without money, it's not possible to start a fashion brand at all. No. Mm. no. Any more questions? Yes, I, I guess we're going to wrap it up. I want to say really thank you so, so much for being here today. Oh. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> Um, yeah, I uh, assume that a lot of your customers uh, have this awareness about sustainability. It's like a trend that people actually believe in this issue and then they come to the brand and purchase it currently. How fast do you think, uh, can you tell us how fast is it growing, like in terms of uh, the customer growth? Uh, like, are there many returning customers? Because then we can actually gauge how fast fast will it also come into the mainstream? Because as the customer is growing, then the need of it is also growing, right? So. Yeah, so you mean if we, uh, the customers that we sell to, if they are coming back to us? Uh, and uh, also how, how many, uh, like how, how much is the increase in your customer base year after year? Uh, it's more than 100%, so it's, we are doubling every season. Okay. Yeah. So they're coming back. So the re the retailers that we have currently, they purchasing again and again. So you don't lose customers, which you know that they will sell well to their final consumers, which is the most important customer at the end of the day. And consumers that purchasing online that are really interested in the brand, they are also purchasing again. And you see that they spread the word. So they share pictures on their social media. They post things about the sustainable sustainable aspects of it. So they really try to push the brands. They're the early adapters. Uh, at the beginning, they really try to help uh, uh, the growth of the brand, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Not like <laughs> the last question, right? <laughs> I think we will stop with this question. <laughs> Okay, I'm very sorry, I'm also very hungry, so <laughs> I will try to keep myself short. So this is a question for Daniel and uh, Heiko. Um, the fashion brand Van Laag published a couple of years ago um, the real production cost of a regular white t-shirt or a regular white businessman shirt. So would this be something you would also be interested in doing or would this be an option to show customers uh, like us uh, the real production costs or, yeah. So, because he was very criticized uh, by publishing this cost, and I think he, um, the margin he combined with, like, for example, cost for employees, so he only showed the cost for materials and the different uh, steps in the supply chain. So, do you, would you criticize him for what he did, or do you think that would be a, a good business move for the company? Uh, it can be a good business move. Uh, I personally wouldn't do it myself. Um, I think if you are very transparent in the materials that you use and where the production, uh, where the final products are coming from, and we are also now starting to uh, film at the manufacturers that we work with so that we not only say where and how we produce, but we also can show it to, uh, to our consumers. Um, but I don't really see the benefits of sharing the profit margins and everything to the final end consumer. But that's just my opinion, yeah. Let's see it in the same way like you, but um, of course it's good to show people um, talking about now the, the new countries like Cambodia, Vietnam, where, the, you know, it's a, there's, there's Far East, we think on China, but China is a high-tech country meanwhile. So for production, there's, there are other countries like Vietnam, Portugal, Cambodia, Myanmar, they are very strong. 
what get the, the people there for money? If I buy, if I make this shirt, for example, I pay between 9 and 12 euro just for the sewing. Yeah, yeah for the time. Not for the pant, for, the, for 6 euro for a denim. Uh, the, the, the buttons here are made of uh, makassar. Now it's a mother of pearl. The dark ones we have out of uh, Tahiti. So Tahiti, uh, mother of pearl. So it's dark, uh, dark uh, charcoal, and the price is totally different. Yeah, so we avoid any any buttons out of uh, polyester or acryl. It's uh, yeah, it's difficult to say. Yeah, so but it's like uh, the cars, for example. Uh, it's uh, you get what you pay, and it's here also. But we don't want to be too transparent. So I agree like that, but. Um, Countries like even in the EU, yeah, we have focus on EU. So in Germany, we have a, a month, a, an hour rate from nine euro now almost. In uh, Greece, it's about 250. In Romania, it's 255. In Bulgaria, it's 155. So there are also a lot of. Uh, it's totally different from the loan, yeah. So what they get, and we are in these countries like Portugal and Greece. So it's much, much higher rate than, than Far East. So that is what we have to calculate also. Thank you. Yeah. Now we will need to wrap it up, but you can meet all the founders and all the experts at the networking break. And I would like you to give a warm applause for, for our panelists. <laughs> There's also a little present from the Tanya, you received one already. <laughs>